The Lord be with you. Welcome to Stone Church of Willow Glen. We welcome all persons into our community, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, and socioeconomic or marital status. That's our way of saying each week, we're glad you're here. It is counted a privilege to walk alongside you wherever you may be in your own spiritual journey. You know, each week we pray the Lord's Prayer. Most churches do. And there's this line that I always think we just skip past with familiarity. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think that's a mission statement in some ways. We exist, we might say, to bring the presence of God, to bring everything that Jesus was about in this world, on Willow Glen as it is in heaven. And you may say, well, that's nice, Fred. That's a nice little grandiose thought. Hold that. I know you have all read all of the newsletter that goes out every week, every word of it. And so this will come as no surprise to you. But in the Stoneworks update, now Stoneworks, for those of you who don't know, is our congregation's kind of driving force for mission, led by Maureen Chandler. In their update... We find this, donated $1,000 to front door communities for the Lifted Spirits. Now, the Lifted Spirits is a day center for vulnerable women. For the Lifted Spirits remodel, are you ready? One client of Lifted Spirits had said, we can relax, no fear, it's like heaven. Hello, that's what it's all about. So prepare your hearts to worship a God who invites us to bring the life of heaven in a great description where everyone can relax and have no fear to bring that to Willow Glen. Let's worship together. body or spirit for the call to worship. Your steadfast love, O God, is better than life. Therefore, our lips will praise you. We will bless you as long as you live. We will lift up our hands and call on your name. You have been our help, and in your presence we sing for joy. Let us continue worship by singing our opening hymn, number 138.
pray. Gracious God, we have just sung that you exist as free and one, a community of love. Help us today to hear that invitation to step in to your inner Trinitarian dance of love and beauty and grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Hear now the call to confession. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. God of hope, we confess our disregard of your care, our doubt of your providence, our blindness to signs of your love. We are afraid to risk our comforts to find new life. We separate ourselves from you and from others and foster divisions between those you love. Help us to amend our lives and make us your faithful people who bear the good fruit of your word in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Take time now in the silence of this place to make this prayer your own. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who saves. The Lord will take great delight in you and will renew you in steadfast love. The Lord will exult over you with loud singing. This is the good news. Thanks be to God. Now that we have experienced the peace of Christ, let's take a moment and extend that to one another in a manner that is comfortable to you. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Our first lesson of scripture this morning is from the 107th Psalm, beginning at verse 1. Uh, you can find it on page 559 of your pew Bibles in the Old Testament. Oh, give thanks to God, for God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of God say so, those redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities, endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to God in their trouble, and God saved them from their distress. God sent out God's word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank God for God's steadfast love, for God's wonderful works to humankind and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of God's deeds with songs of joy. This is the word of the Lord.
read our second reading of Scripture this morning is Emmy Easton. Good morning. This is the second reading from Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which God loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Christ, and seated us with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come God might show the immeasurable riches of God's grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us today to believe that you have something you want us to hear, to trust, something you want us to reflect on and apply to our lives, and help us to believe that you see us right now in whatever we bring into this room, whatever worries, whatever anxieties, whatever sadness and sorrow, whatever triumph and joys and gladness, you see everything in us, the way we get it, the way we don't get it. You see us in all of our contradictions, and your response is always to move towards us, to heal, renew, and restore. Give us grace to believe that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this scripture lesson today from Ephesians chapter 2 is a little bit like being hit by a Mack truck, isn't it? If you were listening... Especially when we read it in the way Paul's original audience may have understood it. Remember, remember something, though. The chapters are all additions from later on. The chapters and the verses, they're just ways arbitrarily picked to help us find our way to find things in Scripture. It makes sense to do that. But Paul has just finished. We don't understand the context here. Paul has just finished extolling the grandeur of God's power and love in what we now call chapter 1. And then he transitions very abruptly. You were dead. Thanks, Paul. That's great. No softening the blow. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived. That's quite the transition. Now, kind of hear me out here, y'all. Just might have a problem or two. I don't want this to sting. Just goes right into it. You were dead. Shocking statement. So we should ask, how so? How are we dead? Paul answers by pointing out that this death was not due to the choices made. This death was due to the choices made by the Ephesians themselves. Choices that led to a death-like existence. Paul talks about trespasses and sins, following the course of this world, the ruler of the power of the air, passions and desires of flesh and senses. It seems, and Paul does this a lot in the book of Ephesians, that he's just trying to come up with words and pictures to paint as comprehensive a picture as possible of how humanity can become entrenched in the complexities and the many layers of evil. I would make the case that Paul is simply observing what we all know to be true. 
You know, after years of imprisonment, internal exile, banishment, Soviet dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn concluded famously, and you've heard some of these before, I'll bet, when I lay there on rotting prison straw, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, not between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. This line shifts inside us. It oscillates with the years. And even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. And even in the best of all hearts, there remains an uprooted small corner of evil. Or, as a pastor friend of mine likes to say, we're not all Ivan the Terrible, but it's not for lack of talent. When Paul talks about being children of wrath, he isn't saying that we are born evil, but rather that choices and actions that lead us into destructive patterns of life. What has become second nature to us through habit. In fact, the word nature is used to describe that which by long habit has become nature, according to the Greek lexicon that I looked at. The death that Paul speaks of here is a self-inflicted wound, the consequence of what he calls trespasses and sins. And it raises another question. What is God's wrath then? It doesn't sound like God. We tend to think of it as divine punishment, thunderbolts. But a more accurate understanding is that wrath represents God allowing us to experience the natural consequences of our choices. In other words, wrath is when God consents <clears throat> to our refusal of divine grace and grants us the dignity and the discomfort of finding our own bottom, to use 12-step language. The end of which is wi a willing surrender to the arms of grace. We can look no further than perhaps the most famous child of wrath, the prodigal son. When Jesus wants us to understand what God is like, he tells a story of a person making horrible choices. Anybody relate to that? And the consequences for them, and that God is a loving parent who scrambles from the porch to run towards their wayward child, embrace him, and welcome him home, and throw a party for him. There's that too. Not a lot of thunderbolt throwing going on there. And this is grace, which is act two of this reading. But God, verse four, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which God loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. So the God who allows the consequences of those choices in your life is also a God who is rich in mercy and can, quote, make us alive together with Christ, all by grace and not by any perfect repenting on our part, lest we get tempted to boast about it. The Greek grammar here used is emphasizes that we are entirely passive in this enterprise. God's grace has done it all. Robert Ferrer Capon, commenting on this, says, Grace takes the agency of salvation out of human hands, whereas the heart's desire of every child of Adam and Eve is to keep it right there, to strive, I love this phrase, to strive endlessly, to find something we can do to make ourselves legitimate. So how are you in your life right now? Striving endlessly to find something that you can do to make yourself legitimate. And aren't you exhausted? Is your timeline on social media telling a story of striving endlessly to make yourself legitimate? Are you in your quiet moments 
scheming or dreaming or planning or how you might legitimize yourself today? What do you think you must have to finally be legitimate? Is every conversation an opportunity for you to humble brag ever so carefully? I would just ask you to think about what are those ways in which you have become tired because you are striving endlessly to make yourself legitimate and not resting in the grace and love of God who says to you, all of this, all of my love, it's all on the house. But grace renders all of our self-legitimizing efforts irrelevant because we are already legitimized, already have been, always have been, as God's beloved children. We have never been separated from God, although it can certainly feel that way. But God's disposition towards you has always been one of mercy, grace, love, never separation. And best of all, and usually forgotten it seems, because everybody loves, you're saved by grace, and we memorize that as children if you were raised in the church. And it feels like to me, to be completely blunt with you, and this is not in the notes, so this is free. It seems to me <laughs> that what we're experiencing a lot in this country right now are people who read verses 1 through 9 and don't get to verse 10. Because verse 10, for we are what he has made us. I like it when it says this, for we are God's handiwork. God's poem, that's literally the word, poema. We are God's poem, God's song. And what is our anthem? Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand. Are you ready? Not for us to do. God doesn't prepare these things just to do them. I love what it says here. It says, as our way of life. It's to be folded in to every little conversation. It's to be folded in to how we think of ourselves and our neighbor. It's to be folded in as to how we view and understand our resources, our money. It's to be folded in as to how we give of ourselves in sacrificial love to Willow Glen, to our families, to our friends, to our neighbors. For we are what he has made us, for we are God's handiwork. How many of you need to hear that today? That you are not what you have made of yourself. You are what God has made. And God's intention all along has been that people become what they were made to be and the earth be filled with the glory of God. Or to quote St. Catherine of Siena, be who you were meant to be and you will set the world on fire in a good way. <laughs> with works that God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Our way of life. The move which the passage celebrates is a move from a death way of being into this world into a life way of being here and now. And the good works are not to be, released, to be reduced to a list of moral do's and don'ts. Throughout the passage, good is about God's goodness and generosity. It's about finding life in which we know ourselves to be made for love and compassion, and that is, in fact, how they are likely to function best. So that our lives might be God's poem, God's handiwork, a poem of grace, a poem of love, saving us from the cacophony 
of our bad choices to write a new song of beauty, goodness, generosity, and grace. We are called Stone Church of Willow Glen. We are called by God not to be a poem of insularity. Not to be a poem of me, myself, and I. Not to be a poem of a church just for ourselves. Not to be a poem of resting on our laurels. No. We are called to be a poem of a church that's not just for ourselves, but for those who are not here. Or maybe those who will never be here. But to love and serve them. A poem of love. A poem of love in action. A poem that is good news for all of Willow Glen and beyond. A poem of grace. A poem that we are called to be the poem of God for Willow Glen. You know, so many of you have benefited from that sweet poem of love that this church has brought to your lives for most of your lives. May God give us grace to keep writing that poem so that other generations may benefit from it as well. It is a song worth passing along. Now in the quiet of the space, listen now to what God's Spirit may be saying to yours. Gracious and loving God, we gather today with hearts open to your presence, mindful of the grace that surrounds us. On this day, we reflect on your boundless love, a love that finds us no matter where we are, no matter what we have done. You are the God who meets us in our brokenness and transforms our lives with mercy and compassion. We thank you for the gift of this new day, for the chance to begin again to be made new by your grace. Gracious Creator, we lift up those who journey across borders seeking a better life. May they find safety, compassion, and dignity in their new homes. Grant them strength to endure hardships especially the hardship of power-hungry politicians, making them targets for hate. Give them courage to face challenges and hope for a brighter future. May their dreams be realized, their contributions valued, and their spirits uplifted. As they navigate unfamiliar lands, guide them with your loving hand. Gracious God, we ask for your spirit to move in us today. For those of us struggling to believe we are loved, remind us that your grace is not earned but freely given. For those burdened by the weight of this world, offer your peace. For those seeking justice in a world of inequality, grant courage. And for those of us striving to make ourselves worthy, quiet our hearts with the assurance that we are enough in your eyes. We lift up our community, O oh God, be present in the lives of those who are hurting, those who grieve, those who are sick, those who feel alone. Surround them with your healing and hope. 
We also pray for the world around us, so full of division and fear. Let us be agents of your peace, speaking up for the marginalized, standing alongside those who are oppressed, and embodying your love in all that we do. We are your people, created for good works, to live out your vision of love and justice in this world. Guide us now and in the days to come so that we might reflect your goodness in all that we say and do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, God has been generous with us, so let us now return to God a portion of what has been given to our care. Oh, 
Holy One, bless our offerings and transform them into healing for the wounded, hope for the disheartened, courage for the frightened, and faith for the embittered. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, as we come to this table today, we are reminded that this is not, and we welcome our children into the service with us, we are reminded that this is not just a meal about remembering something, but a celebration of God's radical welcome and love, where Jesus is present in this meal in a way that we can't particularly articulate, and we are sustained for the journey, individually and collectively, to be God's poem in this world. And so come, all are invited to share in this feast of hope and renewal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the God of life. Loving and gracious God, it is indeed right to give you thanks and praise for you are the source of all life and hope. From the beginning, your love has shaped creation, drawing all things together in your grace. When we were far from you, lost in our ways, following the currents of this world, you reached out in mercy not to condemn us, but to lift us up, making us alive with Christ by your grace. You have shown us the immeasurable riches of your love, raising us from death into life, seating us in heavenly places where grace flows abundantly and hope springs eternal with all creation. We join our voices to praise you, singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. love you sent Jesus Christ not to condemn the world but to save it to bring us from death to life to unite us in peace and to show us a new way of living who on the night he was betrayed took bread and after he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said this is my body given for you eat this in remembrance of me and in the same manner he took the cup and he said this cup is a new covenant in my blood which is shed for the remission of your sins drink this in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul tells us as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Great is the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and cup that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ who unites us as one in his love. By this meal, transform us by your grace. Though we were once dead in sin, make us alive in Christ, that we may walk in the good works you have prepared for us, sharing your hope and your love with all. All glory and honors are yours, O God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as Christ has taught us, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Those of you who are coming to assist in communion, if you would come forward at this time. We take communion here by intinction, which means you dip the bread into the cup. We serve wine in Holy Communion. If you prefer grape juice, you will have that option as well. You will see that in the chalice, it is amber in color. And if you prefer uh, gluten-free bread, you can find that here in the middle of the table. Please come down the center aisle, return to your seats via the outer aisles. The gifts of God for the people of God. 
Come and receive them with gladness. Behold what you are. Become what you receive. Now the prayer of communion. 
together. Loving God, in this sacred meal, we are reminded of your grace and love. May it inspire us to seek justice, welcome the marginalized, and care for the earth and one another. Strengthen us to live in your truth and reflect your inclusive love. Amen. Would you please stand now in body and spirit for our closing hymn. Let's say thank you to C.J. Purdy, who sang for us today with us. Where is C.J.? Thank you. Any relation to that child of God we all love so much, Brock Purdy? No? Okay. 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 And the incomparable Leroy Crom as well. Thank you. So I was extolling the virtues of verse 10 today in that sermon, that final verse, and I'm so... I was so moved by it that God has given us things to do, prepared for us to do good works in advance, that over the weekend I changed the name of this church. I hope that's all right. <laughs> that's just good transitional pastoring. It's advanced. He just changed the name of the church over the weekend, and everybody just loves it, right? So here's the new name of the church I've given. If, you're, if you'd like to hear it, would you like to know the name of your new church? Stone Church 4. Willow Glen. And maybe that could just be our secret name. Because we just redid the sign, right? <laughs> but maybe that can just be something we remember. That the good works that God has prepared for us to do for Willow Glen means that we are Stone Church for Willow Glen. Let's collectively keep that question top of mind of what it means to be good news for this community. Receive now the good word from God. Go now knowing you are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for good works, living as vessels of compassion, justice, and peace in the world. Go now in the confidence that you are deeply loved and called to be loved. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. And we all say together, Amen.